This God is different than others I've heard men speak of. I believe him. He said that through me, all the earth will be blessed. He said he would lead us. We will follow. I have been faithful to you, O oh God. I have crossed the land on your account. Moved my family. Risked my life. I hold nothing from you. Even my only son. Good morning, church. I want to say good morning to Southwest Campus. I want to say good morning to Building D. So glad you're here with us. If this is your first time at Austin Ridge, we are thrilled you're here. Uh, I've been here, it'll be 10 years this summer. And if you're visiting here, I want you to know this is the greatest church I've ever been a part of. It's not because I'm leading it. It's because God's leading it. It's because these folks here are generous and they love people. And that's what we're trying to do. So if you're looking for a church that teaches the Bible and loves people and tries to make an impact in the community... That's our values here at Austin Ridge. We're not the perfect church. If you find the perfect church, don't go to it. You'll mess it up. Uh, but we are striving. We are striving to be the church that God has called us to be. Uh, again, our creativity team's putting that video together that you were watching clips of. It's going to be a 60-minute movie at the end, and we're going to be able to show that movie to you. I loved in the clip today, did y'all catch where Hagar just kind of got a dirty look from Sarah? Did you catch that? Uh, that's going to be fun to get into as well. Two things I'm praying for for the body. I've been praying for a lot of things. I sent you a midweek letter and told you things I'm praying for for you individually. Two things specifically I'm praying for for this body. In 2014, I want us to be better at worshiping and better at giving. Those are two things I want us to improve on. And when I say worshiping, most of you think singing songs on Sunday morning. That's just the, the kickoff of it. It's spending time in the Word. It's praying. It's depending upon God daily. It's, it's, it's understanding his presence is always with you. That's worshiping God. It's, it's obeying is worshiping God. It's obedience. So I'm praying that for us. I'm praying that, I'm praying that we come here on Sunday mornings to gather or Sunday night in our Sunday night service, that you wouldn't hide behind your coffee. You put the coffee down. You turn the phone off. And you worship. And you desperately cry out to God in our worship. I pray that we'd be better at giving. Um, this is a very generous body. Many of you are very generous, but there's still many of us that call Austin Ridge our home, that attend every week and are engaged and are being fed, who don't give anything to the, to the kingdom work here. I pray that we'd become a more giving uh, body. And by the way, the budget's fine. It's not because of the budget. It's because you need to give. It's because of what you need God to do in your life and how he wants to expand kingdom here. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis 13. We, let me catch up. It's been a few weeks since we were in Genesis um, we just saw Abraham go down to Egypt, a play, place he should have never been, taking his wife and his family because there was a famine in the land because he wasn't trusting God. And he went to Egypt to get provision that God had already promised for him. He gives his wife away to the Pharaoh. He doesn't fight for her. He even lies and deceives so that he can protect his own skin. And then he gets his wife back. He gets blessing, even in a, in a wrong situation. He goes back to Bethel. He puts an altar up, or actually goes back to the altar he'd originally put up, and he worships. He calls upon the name of the Lord. He confesses sin. He starts to walk with God again. And it's so much like our Christian life. No one in, in, on this campus, no one at the Southwest Campus walks with God moment by moment and is always obedience. We struggle, we fall, we fail, but we come back to the place where God has spoken. We cry out to him again. We confess sin and God starts to work in our lives again. And today we're gonna get to another interesting text. And I'm gonna tell you something real profound. There's not too many things I tell you to write down, but I'm gonna tell you to write this down because this is really profound, all right? You ready? In your Bibles, Genesis 13 always comes before Genesis 19. I just want you to write that down. 
Because when you think of Lot, when I say the name Lot, and most of us don't name our kids Lot, and there's a reason. When you think of the name Lot, what do you think of in your Bible? Sodom and Gomorrah. That's chapter 19. The reason chapter 19 is the identification of who Lot is is because of the decisions he's going to make here in Genesis chapter 13 today. So really Genesis 13 is the start of the path that leads him away from God and, and literally destroys this man's family. So you're going to see two men today. You're going to see them make two decisions. You're going to see them take two different paths and you're going to see the destruction in the weeks to come of the decisions right here in chapter 13. I believe and I'm going to speak specifically to the men. I believe, man, that this is one of the most important sermons you'll ever hear if you'll apply it. And if you don't, your family could be destroyed. This is a sermon we have to apply. If you're the, the man in your family, if you're the leader of your family, you need to apply this sermon. And if you're here today and, and you're a single mom, you need to apply this sermon for your children. I hear parents say every once in a while, you know, we just really want our kids to figure out what they want to believe and figure out what they think truth is. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Because your kids need to be protected. Your kids are not smart. They're children. You need to give them truth. You need to instill a foundation you need to fight for your family. You need to fight for your marriage. You need to fight for truth. And when the Christian church stops fighting for family and stops fighting for marriage and truth, then we are just like everybody else. And so this passage is going to show these two men. These two men are going to split. They're going to have an argument. They're going to split. And, and the reason they're going to split has to do with money and possessions. And as a matter of fact, it's the first time in your Bible in this chapter where the word possessions is used in your Bible. And I want you to take a note that the first time possessions is used in your Bible, it splits up a family. Okay? So that has that ability in our lives as well. You're going to see two men. One man owns his wealth. One man is owned by his wealth. And these two guys are going to make incredible decisions. Now, people ask me uh, before, do, do I think Lot was a Christian? And I said in an earlier sermon, uh, Lot's a lug nut. Well, I know lots of Christians that are lug nuts, okay? I believe Lot was a Christian. 2 Peter chapter 2 says that Lot was a righteous man, okay? And we're going to get to that passage a little later. I think it's uh, verse 8 in 2 Peter 2. He says that Lot was a righteous man. I've got to be honest, I've struggled all week on reconciling that with this passage and the passage we're going to do in the next few weeks. But have you ever met a Christian when you've looked at their life and you have a hard time reconciling their life with what they claim? You're going to see that today in, in, in Lot's life as well. Uh, you're going to see a man that loses his son. He's going to lose his wife. And his two daughters are going to become perverted just like the culture that Lot places them in and becomes just like that culture. All right? So let's get to the text. Genesis chapter 13. I'm going to start in verse 5. And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling in the land. So you've got these two guys together. They both have a lot of stuff. They both have a lot of possessions. But I want you to see again at the beginning of verse 5. And Lot, who went with Abram. Why does Lot have any possessions at this point in his life? Because of Abram. Remember, Abram is Lot's uncle. Lot's his nephew. Abram promised a family member that he would take care of this lug nut named Lot. And the only reason Lot is probably at this point, honestly, even alive is because of Abram. And you're going to see this guy that should be so grateful to Abram and so grateful for everything and anything that he has, but yet he's going to be the opposite. He wants more. And as we walk through this text today, some of you are thought, some of you think, some of you would say, if you were honest, if God would give me more, then I would be happy. Here's what happens when God gives you more. Then you have a management problem, <laughs> okay? Kids, kids are a blessing. They're a management issue, all right? Church, ministry, ministry's a blessing. As we've grown as a church, you know what, I, what keeps me up at night? Management issues, Church becomes a management issue as well. Some of your businesses, they have flourished. God's answered your prayers. And yet, what keeps you up at night? The management issues. And sometimes you start thinking, you know, I remember when there's just three in the office and how fun that was. You didn't think that then. Let's just get bigger. God, give me more. I'll be happier. God gives more, and you're not as happy. Scarcity and abundance both cause issues in our lives. 
And whether you are scarce in what you have or abundant in what you have has nothing to do with whether you're going to trust God or not. Here's something I want you to know about the Bible. The Bible never says how many square feet your house should have. The Bible never says this house is too big, this house is too small, that car is too nice. The Bible never says that. You cannot judge someone if they're materialistic based on how big their house is. What you have to do is you have to watch their life over a period of time and you'll find out whether they're materialistic and greedy people or not. There are folks who have large houses that give tons of money away. There are folks who have smaller homes that just grab every dollar they can grab. Who's materialistic and who's greedy? And so we're going to see this played out uh, in this text as well. These two guys are fighting over the land. Who was the land promised to? Not a trick question. Abram. So Lot should at the least have said at this point, you know what? God said the land's yours. That should count for something. I'm going to give it to you, and I'm just going to stay with you. Every time this guy's around Abram, this guy gets blessed. This guy should just say, you know what? I just like the table scraps. I'm just going to hang out with Abram because blessing always comes. But this guy's going to get a little too smart for his britches, if you will. He should have said, you're my uncle. Sarah, that whole thing in Egypt, that wasn't good for your wife. I want Sarah to have some good days. You just take what you want. I'm just going to hang out with you. So they start fighting over the land. You see, Lot is a self-centered man. Lot is a man who operates by sight instead of faith. Abram's a man who starts to learn to operate by faith instead of sight. Lot forgets that the nation is being given to Abraham and his descendants to be a blessing to the other nations. Lot starts to think that this land is being given to them to be a blessing to him. We do that with church, don't we? We, we forget that church is here. The bride of Christ was left by Jesus to be a blessing to all the people who need to come to know Jesus. And we start to think that the church is here to bless me and for me to consume. And we start to think of church as whether I like it or not, and we become more Lot-like instead of Abram-like. That church is here to bless the nations. This land was given to bless the nations. Lot is going to be a guy who wants the glory, who wants the credit, who wants the power, who wants the blessing. A lot of people have taught this passage and connected it to the prosperity gospel. If you trust God like Abram trusted God, then God will bless you the way he blessed Abram. The problem with that is everybody in your New Testament would stand and say, that's not true of my life. All the disciples, they trusted God to death, and what happened to them? Nothing but struggle. Jesus, who was the only obedient one every moment of every day, what happened to him? We killed him. (laughs) The prosperity gospel is a man-made doctrine to say if you do A, B, C, then God is now having to Uh, is is dependent upon you and has to now do D. God can do whatever he wants. God blesses disobedient people and he blesses obedient people. Were you ever blessed before you came to Christ? Yes. What does that mean? God blesses disobedient people. Your obedience has nothing to do with what God's going to do or not in the fact of what he wants to do sovereignly. Your obedience becomes a sweet aroma to others around you, and then God, in turn, loves to do things with your obedience that becomes a blessing to your life. Uh, Maybe we need to redefine blessing. When I say, who wants to be blessed, I think our first thought in America is, I want more money. (laughs) What if blessing is your spouse adores you because you love her well or love him well? What if blessing becomes your your kids love Jesus at a young age, they avoid the dumb things in life that most of their friends do, and they make a great impact for the kingdom growing up, even though they never make more than $40,000 a year? What if great blessing is your reputation leads people to Christ just because of what people know about you, whether they actually know you or not? What if blessing is people come to you when they're at the lowest because they know you have some wisdom that the world cannot offer them? What if that's blessing? You see, we've got to redefine what blessing looks like. But Lot has already defined what blessing looks like. I want more. Here's what you see from Lot, and you never hear him say anything. You never, you never see him pray. You never see him seek God's will. You never see him build an altar. He makes some of the biggest decisions of his life not consulting God. That's my fear of some of us. Well, let's see what happens in the story. Look at verse 8 with me. 
Then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Who should have been saying, verse 8, Lot, hey, this is your deal. I'm just along for the ride. Abram, here, here's a point I want you to get here. When you trust God, not just what you see, but the unseen, you are free to do whatever it takes to make peace with another person. You are free to give up anything you need to give up to reconcile with another person. It doesn't matter if they get out the deal better than you. It doesn't matter if they get more than you get. You are free because you're trusting in the promise of Christ. Here's the truth I want you to catch about Abram and his faith. He could give this land away a thousand times and God's still going to bring it back. He can't lose. When you trust God, it doesn't matter if you humble yourself and say you're sorry first. It doesn't matter if you give more than the other person gives. You can't lose because God is going to win. You with me? And that's what Abram understood here. Look again at verse 8. He said, Lot, let there be no strife. You take whatever you want. My herdsmen, we don't want them to argue. We're family. Verse 9. By the way, one of the biggest requests we get in counseling here is family uh, arguing over money. Verse 9. I ought to preach this at a funeral. That's when all the family, or a wedding. I'll do this at a wedding. <laughs> Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. Abraham realizes that it's all God's and God's going to do whatever he wants. He realizes what Proverbs says, that God causes the die to land on the number that he wants the die to land on. Man can throw the dice, but it lands on the number God tells it to. I'll give it away because God's... What has Abraham learned from Egypt? Wow, God will provide. He gave his wife away in sin. Now he's going to give the land away in faith. <laughs> this man is starting to grow. This man is starting to learn what it means to become a blessing to people around him. He says, let's have peace. I love you. Let's not fight. You pick first. What a change from the schemer we saw in Egypt with this man. What's also interesting about this is in Egypt, Abraham is consumed with survival. Now all of a sudden he's consumed with God's glory. Who gets the most glory here? How can I give God the most glory? I'll submit and I'll trust and I'll go by faith instead of by sight. When we truly grab the promises of God, we can give up whatever it takes to reconcile with whoever we need to reconcile. When we truly follow the promises of God, when you realize that you right now in the present sit on the right hand of the throne of the Father and everything that's true of God, all the promises that are true of him are now true of you, even though you can't obtain all those things right now in the present because they're already true right now in heaven, they're already true right now in the present and they will be given all in the future, then you don't have to grasp anymore. You don't have to hold grudges when you know that God's going to fix everything. You don't have to lack forgiveness when you know that God's forgiven everything. What does it mean to be a Christian in 2014 for you? It means to give more. It means to worship more. It needs to confess more. It needs to forgive quicker. It needs to respond godly. It means to be Christian. Is Abram acting here in belief or unbelief? He's acting in belief. He went to Egypt and said, you know what, I'm going to hedge my bets. I'm going to self-protect. Now he's saying, you know what? Lot, you take whatever. Lot, let's play this little game. You make a decision, and then we'll just let you think you're actually getting your way. Because God's in charge. You know what? Abraham says, I trust God. <laughs> People who walk by faith can give up whatever is needed to do whatever God calls them to do. Look at verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt and the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It's like Moses just goes, da, 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 da. <laughs> he looks out. Does it say that Lot prayed? No. Did he say, Abraham, let's hold hands and pray? No. He looks up. He sees this land. They're sitting at the highest point of central Israel. They're about 3,000 feet in the air. And they're looking out. And he looks and he sees all this beautiful, fertile uh, farming land, this beautiful rivers. And his eyes get big as saucers. And then Moses lets you know the direction he's looking in is the direction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I've already told you this a few times from your Bible, but what direction do people go to in Genesis as they're walking further away from God? Do you remember? 
east. If you go east out of Eden, you hit Babylon. If you go east of Babylon, you hit Sodom and Gomorrah. Which direction is Lot looking right now because he's seen Sodom and Gomorrah? East. So this man's about to make a decision that will ruin his life. I want you to note there in verse 10, it says, Lot looked up. Not to God, but to the earth. Stuff. Look down at verse 14. Look what God tells Abram. And the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes. Same words in the Hebrew. Hey, Abram, I want you to look up. Lot's already looked up. Lot looked up and saw the earth. I want you to look up and I want you to see me. So Lot is deciding what he wants to take. By the way, your eyes, you realize your eyes always show your values, right? What your eyes are lured to. If it's a woman, if it's cash, if it's a house, if it's a car, whatever it is, what are your eyes are lured to? That's where your values go. I could, I could probably tell you your values if you could tell me what your energy, what gets you energetic, what gets you passionate. I could probably tell you what your values are. What are your values in 2014? We get tons of prayer requests every week, and it's not a bad prayer request. We get tons of prayer requests every week. Would you bless my business? Or would you heal my aunt? But you get very few prayer requests. God, would you rip my heart open in such a way that I know you in 2014 in ways I've never known you before? God, would you do things in my life only you can pull off? Would you make me a fragrant aroma of the grace of God in my neighborhood, in my family? Lord, I lift up my mom to you. She doesn't know you. I lift up my father to you. I lift up my brother to you. Lord, would you take my business and make it glorifying to the kingdom? Because then you will be what? Rich. It's all about values. Jesus said it like this, wherever your heart is or wherever your, your money is, that's where your value is. If your money is your value. So Abraham is starting to believe the promises of God and also he's believing the God of the promises. And when you think of chapter 19, you've got to understand chapter 13. By the way, I want you to understand this. Chapter 13 there's 25 years that pass from this text to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in chapter 19. So for 25 years, this decision is fermenting. Now, we can do something today that's disobedient to God, and we may not see the effects for 25 years. What do you and I think of when we go that long and not see the effects? We got away with it. It, was, it wasn't a big deal. It's not going to hurt anybody. 25 years later, this man's going to lose everything because of the decision he made in chapter 13. And by the way, the decision he made in chapter 13 came after he made several little decisions along the way. So they're sitting on this high part, and he looks and he sees Sodom, and he sees Gomorrah. You see, Lot is a foolish man. Look with me again at verse 13, or at 13. Now the men of Sodom were wicked Great sinners against the Lord. That little phrase, great sinners, wicked and great sinners, is very rare in your Bible. It suggests there's, there's sin going on that's more than just the normal sin. There's perversity happening, and you're going to find out in this text that Lot's going to pitch his tent near Sodom. Many like Lot would certainly choose heaven over hell if given the choice. But my fear is many of us would choose earth over heaven because we've made that choice. What's more important to you, your comfort right now or eternity? See, we think in terms of we're going to live, we're going to die. The Bible thinks in terms of you're going to live and you're going to spend eternity. Death is, is irrelevant in the Bible. Death is just a passing on to the real life, to the real living. So again, do our values point to eternity or do our values point to here? So he's going east. He's going further away from God, and he pitches his tent. Look with me again back at verse 12. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. You know what Lot didn't do? Lot didn't do what I fear a lot of us will do as businessmen and women. Lot didn't do this. I got a job offer in Albuquerque. It's more money. It's a better potential for my career. And so many times people will not stop at that point and say, that's great, but I need to pray. And I need to pray with my family. And I need to find out, is there a church there that teaches the Bible that we can connect to? 
And I need to pray, well, my daughter has some friends that love Jesus. Well, my wife has some friends that love Jesus. But instead, what Lot's doing, he's doing his cost analysis. He's doing his demographic studies. He's studying the, the housing market. And he's just saying, this is a great opportunity for us. And I imagine his wife, as a good wife, is probably saying, hey, if that's what you think we should do, let's go. And the daughters follow him. They don't know about Sodom yet. God does. If you're going to move, and I know some of you are going to have to move. If you're going to move, keep tithing to Austin Ridge. But if you're going to move, <laughs> if you're going to move, you better make sure that it's not just because it pays more money. You better make sure that you can make more of a kingdom impact where God's calling you to than you could staying here. Because I'm telling you, there's a lot of miserable folks making a lot more money who are not making any impact on anybody. And so Lot is that guy. Abram's learning to confess sin, learning to worship, learning to trust. Lot's just saying, what I see. It makes sense. It makes financial sense. Look at verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated with him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward. It's, I want to make a point there. It's interesting that God has, didn't speak to Abram that we know of in Egypt and God's not speaking to Abram through this whole conflict. When does God speak to Abram? After Lot just left. And God's speaking to this man. He says, look every direction. Even the direction that you just gave away. <laughs> look at verse 15. For all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth. So that if one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Meaning no one will be able to count it. So again, he's sitting up on a 3,000-foot hill in central Israel looking eastward, westward, northward, and southward. What he's going to do is he's going to look out to the north and he's going to see Mount Hermon. And this amazing mountain where so many things in your Old Testament happens. He's going to look out to the south. He's going to see the, the Dead Sea and the hills of Abron. He's going to look out uh, to the east. He's going to see the Jordan and the Jordan Valley. He's going to look out to the west and he's going to see the Mediterranean. That's what he's seeing right now in each direction. And God is telling him, it's all yours. Well, God, I kind of just gave some away. No, you didn't. You just wait. You can't give away something that's not yours. It's mine anyway. You realize that everything you have is his anyway, right? And so we do what God wants us to do with what he's given us. And he gazed and the, God audibly speaks to him. And the promise was unconditional and the promise was forever. Now, there's a big debate on this text. I'm not going to get too far into it now. I'm going to get to it uh, really more in chapter 15. There's a big debate in this text. That is the offspring of Abraham. Is that just the nation of Israel? Is that just physical Jews that are born Jewish? Or is that Gentiles included? Is that the New Testament church? Big debate. People write books about it. People split churches over it. I'm going to give you my 30,000 foot view opinion. And then we're going to get more into it in chapter uh, 15. You need to understand, because some and I'm going to say this uh, delicately, there is a movement in the church in Austin and other places that people are going crazy about becoming more Jewish, okay? And they want me to speak more Jewish things. I'm not Jewish. I'm a Gentile. Here's what you need to know about Abraham. Abraham was not Jewish. Abraham was a Babylonian from the land of the Chaldeans, and God came and converted Abraham. And Abraham was then called to be the leader of a new nation called Israel. And when it talks about the descendants of Abraham, I don't believe it's just physically born Jews. Here's the truth about physically born Jews. They still have to trust in Jesus whether they're born Jewish or whether they're born Gentile. That's why we do ministry to Jewish people. That's why we love Jewish people. People will say this, that if you become a blessing to the nation of Israel, then God will bless you. I don't believe that. I believe when you become a blessing to those who have trusted in Jesus, converts, then God will bless you. That's both Jewish converts. That's both non-Jewish converts. And here's the thing about Abraham you need to understand. Abraham's an evangelist. What do evangelists do? They create converts. And so as people start to trust the God of Abraham... 
as people start to follow the way of Abraham, as people start to leave the world and start clinging to a world to come, then they become the genealogy of Abraham. If you're here today and you love Jesus and you trusted in Jesus, you're a descendant of Abraham. Now, I believe biblically that God is not done with the nation, the physical nation of Israel yet. I believe God's still going to do some amazing things with that nation. But everyone who's going to be in heaven has been born again, not just born a certain nation, not just born a certain family. Everyone's going to have trusted in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so again, we're going to get more into this, but it's not by birth that you come to Christ. It's by rebirth. Folks, that's everything of what Jesus preached in the New Testament. That's what frustrated him with the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He was frustrated because they're like, well, of course we're good because we were born father, our children of Abraham. Here's what you need to understand about God in the Bible. God does not bless grandchildren. He blesses children. Here's what I mean by that. God breaks Abram, but God's also going to have to break Isaac. God's also going to have to break Jacob. God's also going to have to break Joseph. Why? Because you can't just garner your faith of your grandparents. You can't just get the DNA of a great-great-grandma who's a good Baptist. It's got to be your faith. The biggest misconception with Christians is, if I ask this question right now, if you were to die today and go to heaven and God would say, why should I let you in my kingdom, what do you think you'd say? I can preach this over and over and some of you say the same things. I've been a pretty good guy. I've tried my best. Compared to most people, I think I'm pretty moral. I, I was a one-woman man. I was a one-man woman. I loved my kids. And you start giving a spiritual resume. That's what Pharisees would have done. That's what Sadducees would have done. That's what religious people do. That's what hypocritical, judgmental people do. Because if that's your thought, you can't look at someone else and not be judgmental. What Jesus comes and says, it doesn't matter what family you're born into. you got to be born into the family of God. He says, Nicodemus, a Jewish person, you must be what? Born again. Why? Because it doesn't matter who your daddy is, your great-grandfather is. It's who I am. <laughs> so we're going to hit that again in chapter 15. Um, but that was just a little aside to prepare you for it. And don't email me this week about it. Wait till the 15th, then email me after chapter 15. That's fine. And we can disagree on this. That's okay. There are smarter people than you and I who disagree on the nation of Israel and what's going to happen in the future. But what I'm saying is this, is that Abraham was not Jewish when God called him. Look at verse 17. He says to Abram, arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. I love that verse. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled by the oaks of Mamre, which are at Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. In that day, kings, the way they would assert the domain of their reign is they would walk around their kingdom. And they would put statues up in the far reaches of their kingdom to show their sovereignty. And here's what Abraham does. God says, I want you to walk around the whole land. I want you to walk to the east, to the west, to the north, and the south. And he walked across the whole and around the whole promised land. And I believe as he's walking, I believe the, the, the global promises of God and I believe the personal promises of God are starting to become Abraham's in his own heart. And I think this man's starting to believe. And he's walking around. He's literally claiming this land as God's. I believe he's preaching. I believe he's evangelizing. I believe people are getting converted. And what does he do? He goes to a place and he puts another altar. You can also put in your Bible, he built a church. So now he has a church in the northern part of the kingdom and he has a church in the southern part of the kingdom. What did Abram do to get the message of Jesus out? He built churches. Places where you can come and worship. Places where you can come and sing. Places where your children can hear about the Lord. Places where you can hear the word taught. Folks, that's why Austin Ridge is about spreading out and not just building up. We want to build more churches. There are more people in Austin whose lives are jacked up that need Jesus. And so we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We're spreading the gospel out. We're going to build this, this campus up and we're going to keep building churches. Why? Because more people need to know Jesus. And that's what Abraham did. He walked around the land. I wish I could have been walking with him. Yep. I don't know what he said. I don't know if he's walking around saying, I hereby proclaim all this as God's. I mean, I think God already knew that and Abraham already knew that. I think he went. I think he stopped. I think he just prayed. God, I don't know how you're going to do this, but I pray for the folks who live on this land right here. It's like a mama going into, into their kid's bedroom before the babies arrives and just starts praying for that. But Lord, I pray that this would be a room of comfort for my child. I pray my little boy, my little girl would come to know you at a young age. I pray I could lead my child to Christ on this bed. 
I pray you'd bless his sleep. I pray that he would be strong in stature and strong in courage. Or as a teacher going to the classroom, touching each chair. Walk, Lord, I pray for Sally. I pray for Billy. I pray for Ted. I, pray, I, I know their parents don't love you, but I do. And I love this little boy, and I know you do too. It's walking into your business and just proclaiming, God, you are here. You're going to do things in this business. I'm your missionary here. I'm your representative. Use me here. And I believe that's what Abram's doing throughout, this, throughout the land. You see, when, when, when your faith gets more heavenward instead of earthward, you become free to be generous. And this man just gave away the land. Now he's walking around the land saying, it's mine because it's God's. It's amazing faith. And he builds altars and he prays. You see, Lot, I believe Lot had faith, but I believe it was through the faith of Abraham. And what I mean by that is I think he had a spiritualness about him. Like I think if you ask Lot, how do you get to heaven, I think he'd have the right answer. But I think it was a spiritual life by proxy. I, I think it's, let me say it this way, one of the biggest concerns I have as a parent, and it should be your concern if you're a parent, is that my kids would be around my spiritual life, but they would never have their own spiritual life. That's one of my biggest concerns as a parent. That my kids would see me pray, but they would never really have a heart for prayer. That, that, that my kids would see my hunger for the word, but they would never be grasped by the grandeur of the holiness of God. And, and tell me if you haven't heard this story. An eight, a nine, a ten-year-old child prays to receive Jesus. We baptize them. We see a cute video on the screen. And then they go through middle school and they go through high school. Then maybe they get in a bad relationship in high school. Um, Maybe one of their parents stopped coming to church because the church does something to hurt their feelings and they don't come back because it's as if I don't like you, so now I don't like Jesus. And then they go to college. And even if they go to a Baptist college or Presbyterian college, they just get all jacked up in there. And they hear professors, and that guy's smarter than me. He thinks what I think is really dumb, so maybe I should listen to him. And then you, you see them when they're 23, 24, and there's nothing spiritual about them. The question is, were they ever a believer? I don't know. We'll find out. But why does that happen? Because mama and daddy's not there holding their hand when they're 22. And they had their spiritualness by proxy. Do you understand what I mean by that? It wasn't really theirs. They never owned it. That's my biggest concern for our children. How are you going to give faith to your kids where they have to own it? You see, I don't, I don't think Lot ever truly owned this. Another concern I have this morning is I believe... Probably some of you are pitching your tents right now near Sodom. And here's the progression you see here. He pitched his tents near Sodom, and then he's going to go into Sodom, and you're going to get to chapter 19, and where is Lot? He's sitting at the city gate. Who sat at the city gates? The town leaders. They would sit at the city gate, and they would make instructions, and they would give laws for the people. As a matter of fact, David saying in chapter 19, who is this sojourner, who is this nomad, who is now ruling over us? You see, you can't just pitch your tents near Sodom. You're going to be all in Sodom. There's no in-between. And so this man gets to Sodom, and over a 25-year period of fermenting this, he runs for city council, <laughs> and he wins. And now he's all in. And you're going to see this in chapter 19. You're going to see his wife destroyed because she takes her eyes back to the world instead of looking to the promise. You're going to see him lose his son, and you're going to see his two daughters um, have incest with him, become pregnant with their father because they are just as perverse as the sodomite culture where his, their daddy moved them to. You think Lot wouldn't have said, you know what, I'll give back some of the money I made if I could get my family back? Let's close. Let's, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to show you what Peter says about Lot It'll be on the screen. You don't have to turn there. 2 Peter chapter 2. Here's what it says. And if he rescued righteous Lot, this is talking about God, if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and he heard. Isn't that haunting? So here's what the Bible says. He uses two words. I want to point this out. He says he saw he was living distressed. That literally means in the Greek being beat down on a consistent basis. And then it says he was tormented. The Greek word used there in 2 Peter 2 verse 8 for tormenting his soul is the same word as the Greek word used for hell. 
So what Peter would say is, if you try to be spiritual in Sodom, but you're not actually engaged with God, and you're just doing it by proxy, your life's going to become hell on earth. And that's my concern for some of us as we enter 2014. You may attend church, you may have heard me preach hundreds of sermons, you may be in a life group, but you don't engage God. There's no Tuesday time with God. There's no Thursday desperate calling out in prayer with God. It's just somewhere you attend. You're around spiritual people, and if I ask you, how are you going to go to heaven? Oh, Pastor Jesus, you got the answers, but your heart's never been grasped by God. Well, Pastor, how do I do that? You take your eyes off of stuff and you put it back on him. Pastor, how do I do that? Start praying. <laughs> Pastor, how do I pray? Get your notebook out. Write letters to God if that's the way you start. Take a book in the Bible. Take John, Matthew. They're all good. Take one of the books in the Bible. Take a chapter a day. Write three questions each day and give yourself one application. And say, this is something I'm going to work on today. God, would you help me work on this today? If you don't know how to pray or what to pray for, start praying for your family. Lord, would you be with my wife? Would you be with my husband? Would you be with my kids? Would you protect them? But would you grow them? Lord, I pray for my mom. I pray for my dad. I pray for my business. Just start praying those things. And then when God starts doing stuff, write it down. And then when you start doubting him, you know what you're going to do? You have a, a prayer log of God's faithfulness. You're going to go back and say, yep, God's always taking care of me. Why am I doubting it now? I'm going to stop. And there are some things in our culture that are Sodom-like that are pulling us in, men, pornography. I was reading this past week, the average age of, of a child being open to pornography is the age of eight. Eight. Now you're thinking, what's wrong with these kids today? What's wrong with these parents today? Here's the problem. Why would a kid have an iPad, an iPhone, a computer in their room where they could be that way behind closed doors? No kid's going to look at porn in front of their mom in the kitchen. Right? But see, what we do as parents is, well, I've got to go spend my time playing this and doing this and being a part of this. And they're fine. They're good kids. You know who's raising your kids now? <laughs> Sodom. That's who's raising your kids now. So don't get surprised when they turn 22 and they have no desire for spiritual things. You know why? Because they got it by proxy. And that's my concern. This text has nothing to say whether you have a lot or a little. You can't go out in the parking lot after you leave this sermon and go, oh, that's a nice car. Put a lot sticker on a lot. <laughs> if I were to die today and God were to say, why should I let you my kingdom? What do you think you'd say? Here's the only, only, only biblical answer. Because I've placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. It's not anything I've done. It's what he's done. And I trust him. And whatever is true of him is now true of me. Isn't that amazing? And now I get to live my life in freedom. I still mess up. I still fail. But now I've got a grace point to come back to. I want to close with just a little uh, snippet. I'm, I'm over time. I apologize. A little snippet of my week this week. So I went to the hospital to see a good friend of mine named Bill Ferris. He's a member of Austin's Bible Church. Bill Ferris, um, a few years back, fell off a bunk bed on a fishing trip He's a quadriplegic um, and has just been battling. And I went to the hospital, and i got to be honest with you, it, it was a rainy, remember this week, rainy, cold, early in the week? I was like, I don't want to go to the hospital. It was raining. I had my leather jacket. The rain's going to mess my leather up. I know, I'm horrible, just like you. <laughs> right. I go in there and I spend an hour and I don't know, 15 minutes with Bill. The man's sitting on a cushion in a bed. He's got two straws. One he calls a nurse on, one he spits water back into because he's got a food tube going through his nose, going to his stomach. And I'd, I'd give him his bottle of water and he'd sip some water and he'd spit the water back in after he swashed it around his mouth. I spent some time with him. I'm just sitting there feeling, like, man, I'm horrible. I can, if I ever complain again, kick me in the gut. And then I was walking out and I prayed with Bill and I said, Bill, I said, I love you. And I said, I'm so sorry about this. You know what Bill said? He goes, I'm not. This is great. He said, don't get me wrong, this has been hell. <laughs> then he went on to tell me about two ladies in the hospital he had led to Christ in the last five days. One was a Muslim. He said, Brad, I never would have been able to share Jesus with these two ladies if I hadn't been sitting in this hospital bed. And he looked at me, here's what he said. He goes, Brad, it's all temporary. That's a great theologian. 
right? It's all temporary. So don't put all your energy into something that's not going to last anyway. Love God, love people, pray like crazy, give like crazy, worship all the time. Amen? That's what we're going to do in 2014. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for this text. We thank you for Bill. And I know his heart is to walk out of that bed, walk out on his legs one day. We pray for that. Father, your desire may be to take him on before that. I don't know. But either way, I know that guy loves you. And he's my hero. I pray that we, whether we're laying in a bed or whether we have all of our faculties, we would be thankful and grateful for everything, knowing that all blessings have come for the one who's given everything for us. It's in his name, the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.